I think Evolution and Northern Star have been great counter-cyclical, semi-contrarian growth stories in recent years in Australia. Now, they've probably reached levels where their ability to be contrarian and counter-cyclical is somewhat limited, but they, they were buying assets from major companies when the major companies were throwing them out. They're good examples from the past. At the moment, it's, it, I'm struggling to spot majors which are investing with a counter-cyclical uh, sort of attitude. They've got, they've got two, I mean, they are remarkably exciting exploration targets at the moment. They're like nothing you see in the listed market in terms of size and scale. You might find absolutely zilch, but they have district discovery potential in both cases of their targets, and that's what's drawn us to that. Lithium's the, the last commodity I want to touch on, Headley. They've gone flying beyond what you think is reasonable. It was pretty hyped and, and hot at the minute. How does this sort of behaviour make you think about your lithium investments? Well, to be careful for a start. In fact, I'll just quote my father here because this is where the work comes from. But people are always prepared to pay more for something that they don't understand than something that they do. Right, oh, no, get a money miners. Welcome to Wednesday, twenty third of August, and the JD showcase continues. God, cheers, JD. If you just keep doing interviews flat out everywhere, I could probably lift my golf frequency. <laughs> I'm loving this, mate. Anytime, mate. Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. No, they, they were the sponsor yesterday. <laughs> they were. We've got a different one today, but we'll give a bit of an intro. So this is an interview with Headley Widup of Lion Selection Group. So they're, they're a bit of an interesting beast there. They're, um, they're listed at a, at a market cap that floats in and around $60 million now, but they've recently exited a few positions. So they've got a bit over six, $76 million bucks in cash now and they are focused on putting that in the ground into exploration type businesses so are they a listed investment company jd or they're a, they're th trade they are yeah so <laughs> lsx they they trade yeah. under um yeah so they've got a number of of positions but they're really looking to fill that out and you'll hear throughout the discussion they're talking about getting into 10 to 20 different names to put that money into the ground they bought into a couple that we've spoken about recently, both Alto and Great Boulder. Mm. So they've been, um, yeah, been buying a few shares and as well a few unlisted plays. I'm, I'm curious, JD, uh, at, after we finish listening to your, your full roadshow of uh, fundy interviews in, in Melbourne, I, I'm going to have to pick your brain about who you reckon has the best approach, the best strategy and the best insight of all of the fundies in Melbourne because uh, you've, you've bloody talked to them all now. All right, well, maybe we've got to give him an overrated, underrated, and we'll just against the fund managers. <laughs> we've got a few. We've got a few more in the books to come in a in a couple months' time. That'll that'll round out the the selection of fundies that focus on resources because you've got that mix in Melbourne. You've got those ones like these, like today and like yesterday's chat with John Forward that focus exclusively on resources, and then you've got the broader ones like like Daddy at Dat Capital who have a resource component and are interested in resources. And then there's other groups like um, Chester, which invest in resources, and there's a few more out there, Paragon, that also invest in resources, but not exclusively. So, yeah, you can ask me those ones once we've uh, done the full works. <laughs> or just measure performance. <laughs> Good stuff. Right, hey, let's rip it, I reckon. Thanks to our partners for today are K-Drill. Pretty much K-Drill is keeping the mining industry alive by finding minerals in the ground, penetrating the rock and ripping out chips and core. Absolute so, bloody legends. So if you wanted to f make a discovery, mate, you'd call you'd call K-Drill. You'd call Ryan O'Sullivan and say... Ryan O'Sullivan can probably do it with his bare hands <laughs> if he really needed to. I've seen him do it. I've seen him rip rocks out of the is, ground with his bare hands. It feels like the first time you've remotely spoken about what the company actually does when you're advertising them. There's prob they're probably based on this sponsorship and what we've been, uh, how we've been articulating their thinking of a name change to just Ryan O'Sullivan drilling. <laughs> Just to keep it simple. And it wouldn't – look, it wouldn't be a bad move, I don't reckon. Yeah, forget Diamond or RC. It's uh, Ryan with his bare hands will find you a mineral discovery. And probably shitloads of it. <laughs> yeah, he smells it. Cheers, Kadri. <laughs> <laughs> right, hey, let's rip it. Here we go. G'day, Money Miners. We've got another great interview in store today. I've got Headley Widdup of Lion Selection Group sitting next to me. Headley, how are you? Oh, very well, and thank you for reaching out and inviting me to chat to you guys. I've been seeing what you've done uh, with the growth of your podcast, and it's growing strongly. It's uh, really, really entertaining to listen to, so really pleased to be a part of it. Appreciate the, the kind words. So you've got about 15 years' experience from what I could 
surmise with Lion Selection Group, and then you also worked as a geologist before that. And I think it's a it's a really great time to get you on the show, given where we're at right now in the exploration investment landscape and everything that's sort of going on. So we're going to sort of start the conversation by going a bit into your background, and then I want to hear about the macro and how you see things at the moment, and then we'll talk a bit about Lion Selection Group, a few commodities, and then what everyone wants to hear about, a couple of companies that you like. How's that sound? Brilliant. That sounds perfect. All right. So like I just mentioned, you, you started as a geo and you worked at some, some pretty well-known operations around, around Australia. Mount Keith comes to mind, Olympic Dam, Mount Isa. What was it sort of like initially being, being a geo in the, the late 90s, early 2000s? And what sort of gets you excited about the, the natural resource industry? Yeah, awesome. Oh, well, look, uh, there's a sense of past tense in the way that you asked that question as if I stopped being a geo. Uh, you never, ever stop being a geologist once you become one, un- unless uh, you post-qualify as a mining engineer and they do a surgery which disconnects the front and back of your brain. Um, so I've never had that done, still a geologist, but moved into investment uh, about 15 years ago. So, yeah, started at Mount Keith, um, open pit graduate geologist. Uh, I was working on a big drill out of the sort of stages four, five and six of that enormous pit there. So, you know, it was great for a young geo, just loud things, uh, lots of action. Um, Olympic Dam worked under the ground there for two and a half years, um, was involved in an enormous uh, structural interpretation of the, ins- the whole ore body, which, which went into how the rock mass breaks when it's blasted. So we were reducing dilution and uh, influencing mine planning, which was a, a pretty exciting time in the history of that deposit from an academic point of view, of course. Um, and uh, then moved to Mount Isa, uh, met my wife in South Australia, didn't expect that to happen, but uh, went to the smallest town I've ever worked in and found a wife. Uh, she followed me, uh, we went to Mount Isa, uh, worked starting an open pit on top of some old underground mining voids there. Um, and then we moved to Kalgoorlie where I worked at St Ives uh, for the, the last part of my geological career before moving into investing. And I guess, uh, you know, ha- how's that in terms of going from one to the other? I'd say working in mine geology in particular, y- you always have problems to solve. They always needed to be solved five minutes ago. There's a real sort of production adrenaline rush uh, from all of that. Um, I'm sure Maddie, who's worked underground, could relate to all of that. Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't mention those words, open cut around Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did work underground, so, you know, we could relate on that. But a, bit, um, a bit of credibility. <laughs> But if, that, if that's what it takes, I'm, I'm pleased to take it. Um, there's always a problem to solve. Uh, and, you know, when you move into investment, uh, it's more about a slow, considered decision. And, in fact, in many cases in investing, a, a legitimate decision is to sit and do nothing uh, and just to watch how it evolves and then make a decision later, which, which can be pretty frustrating. Uh, but having said that, working in investing, particularly at Lion, we're looking at different projects every single day. So rather than working on the same project continuously for 18 months, two years, two and a half years, this is something different every single day. And I, I love that content. And what was the, the sort of thinking between making the change in working on a mine site as a geo going into the, the natural resource investment world? I'd always been considering how I develop my career uh, upwards and to, to, to become uh, a manager or working into the funding of deposits or, or you know, things coming out of the ground and helping to grow the industry. Um, my father was the founder of Lion Selection Group, so I was quite familiar with it. And when an opportunity came up, um, I saw that as an opportunity that was worth pursuing. But uh, I'd structured my career prior to that, trying to get as much experience across a broad range of commodities and mining styles as I could uh, in order to make myself more useful, either as a, you know, a manager in a mining company um, or working in the finance space. So this was the first opportunity that came up, uh, and that's the one I took. Beautiful. I'm, I'm keen to dive deeper into Lion Selections Group's investment sort of strategy, but I want to start with a bit of the macro. And you're, you're well known in mining circles for talking to the, to the mining clock, and I'm sure there's plenty of the, the money miners out there that are quite familiar with this, but we've also got you know some younger uni students and younger people in the mining industry. So why don't you just sort of talk to how you see the mining clock and you know broadly the investment cycle in the natural resource world? Sure. So... The market itself, the equity market, is cyclical. Uh, either money's coming or money's going. Um, and, and that basically derives to sentiment. So is the market a safe place to be putting money? Are people making profits on their investments? That tends to draw money in. The opposite is also true. And we see market collapses for a variety of reasons over time. Uh, the mining industry is even more cyclical. It's one of the most capital-intense industries that there are. 
and it's totally dependent on commodity prices for the revenues uh, which which go into the uh, the sector. So that drives intense cyclicity, um, and what it what it results in is this boom bust mentality, which a lot of people talk about, but the clock is intended to capture that. And what it captures is liquidity. So money moving into the mining space and then moving out of the mining space, no matter what's motivating it, that's the cycle. Uh, sometimes it's the, the, the mining sector itself, either through hubris and poor returns on investment, which is what we saw in 2011 and resulted in a horrible bust through to 2015, uh, or it's something which is more financial markets motivated, like the global financial crisis from 2007 and 8 through to 2009. All of them bring about um, the end of a boom, uh, and, and then the boom is motivated by different factors as well. So at 12, that's midnight. That's where the, the boom topples into a bust. The bust takes its, uh, its toll on the sector, if you like. As, as liquidity leaves the market, you see things like companies collapsing, uh, or at least share prices uh, reducing, and it's very, very difficult for small companies to raise money. You see a, uh, a, a massive drop-off in the number of IPOs of uh, new explorers onto exchanges like ASX. You get to six o'clock, that's where you start to see liquidity tick back up again. So notionally, the start of the boom, but it doesn't feel like a boom. It, it just feels like the, the, the last 12 months, which was would have been hard, and uh, as you work into it, um, you, you work back through to uh, 12 o'clock again and things like transactions get bigger, um, larger amounts of money gets raised, et cetera, et cetera. So where are we sort of at in, in your opinion? Is it one o'clock, two o'clock, midnight still? So we, uh, we, we, we told the market, our investors, and in, in the various ways that we commentate to the market in late 2021 that we thought that 2021 was going to be a peak year, so possibly 12 o'clock. We rectified that in 2022 and said, yes, it, it was 12 o'clock uh, and we've been coming down the other side since. Now, I haven't settled my mind around whether it's one, two or three at the moment. What worries me in terms of the short-term outlook is that when you're coming down uh, the other side and liquidity is, is low and dropping away, before you can bottom out, you need to see some kind of a driver to create positivity and, and usually there's a capitulation moment involved there as well. Um, I couldn't tell you what I think a capitulation moment might be, but I think the drivers in terms of when the next boom takes place is going to be when some positivity sneaks back into commodity prices. There's a very good long-term outlook for those at the moment, but you know, trend is, fun is trumping fundamentals. So prices are falling, even though there's a, a really wonderful reason uh, to think that commodities will be in high demand, uh, particularly for you know, battery and electrification things like that. So, so how we're sort of talking about it at the moment it makes it sound like the, the whole mining, you know, investment cycle is just one big cycle. But, of course, we've got various commodities out there. And it sort of seems at, at times that some of the commodities run to their own beat. You know, lithium, for example, it's not the same as if you were to, you know, try and get a, a zinc mine off the ground at the moment. How, how do you sort of break it down by commodities in your thinking? Well, at the end of the day, it's all liquidity. And liquidity gets influenced by individual commodities. So in 2000 and uh, seven and eight, and then you know, I suppose moving into um, nine and ten, iron ore was an enormous factor. Uh, it was one of those things in the market that everyone was talking about. Everyone wanted iron ore, um, and I we had a lot of people telling us, "Oh, well, perhaps the clock is driven. Uh, it's a different time according to the commodity that you're in." I think that the way that I boil that down is that um, well, there was a lot of money brought into the market by iron ore, and and iron ore let it go as well because. After the Beijing Olympics in uh, 2008, uh, China didn't come back to the market as a purchaser and iron ore weakened dramatically. It recovered again in 2009, but come 2011, it was one of those things which dropped off most significantly and, uh, and, and let liquidity go. So at the moment, yeah, lithium's big, gold's not, uh, but it's, it's lithium that's bringing liquidity into the market. I, I think that that liquidity has dropped away though. So where you might have been able to raise money to fund a lithium explorer uh, off the back of a pegmatite intersection, but not a lot more detail than that in 2021, I think that's become a lot harder. If you want to fund a lithium company now, you need 100 plus metres and you need that to be showing spodumene across most of it with a reasonable grade uh, as well. That, that's what catches the market's attention and seems to uh, draw the liquidity into big, exciting fundraisings. I want to mention the words that you should never say in investing and they are, is, is this time different? Because when I think about the, the cycle that we're talking about now and you have that say on the one hand and on the other hand you have 
these huge government stimulus and incentive packages, you have the carbon emissions targets that sort of as a, as a society involves a lot of capex that needs to be spent. Does that change your, your thinking at all or is it still the same old cycle that, you know, rings true? Well, I think it's still the same old cycle that rings true. Um, the size, you know, the magnitude of the amplitude of the waves, if you like, um, definitely varies from cycle to cycle. Uh, some booms are much bigger than others and some busts are much more severe. So if what we're experiencing now is a mining bust and if it's just started, it hasn't really been felt by the likes of BHP and Rio Tinto and you would expect that to be the case. And could, uh, could those time, you know, horizons be compressed somewhat? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, I mean, we're, we're probably, what, 12, 18 months in, if you think of it that way. Um, and, uh, well, if you use as an example from history, um, in 2007, uh, late 2007, I think the worst of um, the GFC uh, issues were starting to show their face. Equity markets had persevered and then they started to tumble. They were tumbling hard. Um, if you just look at the Australian market and you break it into the industrials and the resources, which is the two biggest, uh, se that's the biggest separation you can make. So it's the, um, the, the all industrials and the, and the all resources. Um, the industrial started to collapse late 2007. In the resources market uh, continued, or at least the equities did, into well into 2008, driven by the perception that China is going to very much come back and be a big purchaser in the market after the Olympics. Um, what happened though was that China didn't come back and looking back there had been a commodity price weakening which had started at the same time as the rest of the equities did. It's just that the mining equities didn't follow that. There was this sentiment driven, driven perception that everything was going to be fine. So the two collapsed by the same amount, just the miners in a far shorter time and that was driven by commodities. So m my feeling is that sometimes in these things you can be the frog which is slowly boiled because you're in the pot thinking well the long-term outlook is fantastic, but in this case, we've seen commodities all level off and then come down uh, since 2021 as a peak. Uh, so that time frame, in terms of how liquidity, you know, comes and goes from the market, uh, you know, it can be six months in terms of a bust. 1987 was like that. Um, it can be five years. Uh, that's what um, 2011 through 15 felt like. But you know, I think in, in this case, um, that's a bit of a difficult one to read because if stimulus came along and entered the, uh, the Australian, US, Canadian markets, I think you would start to see uh, mining equities in those markets respond differently and perhaps even commodities. But the thing that we're dealing with is, of course, what's the appetite of China? I think that's what's driving commodities. So by the sounds of it, you could sort of place the industrials chart, the commodities chart, and uh, say an ASX resources chart from 21 to 23 over, say, 2007 to 2008, and they'd look kind of similar. What I want to know is what, what are you seeing that's different between these two periods? Yeah, I, I agree that phrase is a dangerous one. So is it different this, this time? Uh, at the high level, no. But uh, shapes, magnitudes and flavours, you know, all, all, all are a little bit different. There was no lithium uh, that time around. There was iron ore. And they're colossally different markets and they draw different sorts of liquidity as well. So uh, I, I tend to think that, um, and I suppose the other thing would be as well, that the mining market had been driven by possibly the biggest boom in living memory uh, by China entering the market as a commodities purchaser. And the effect that that had on uh, commodity prices was to drive a new paradigm. So in copper, uh, I think you could trace that back over 50 years prior to the, uh, the entrance of China, so prior to 2000, and you would have seen copper topping out at very similar levels over a very long period of time as the various busts and booms came and went. After China, that had almost doubled, or it might even have trebled the price at which copper was, was topping out. So that demand growth for something like copper had, uh, had, had increased by a magnitude which hadn't been seen uh, before. And equities responded in the same way. Iron ore is probably another great example. It historically had grown very stably from 20 bucks a ton through to about 40 bucks a ton. Then comes along China and all of a sudden we're talking 150 to 200 bucks a ton. So this enormous buyer comes in and changes the magnitude. So that's what would be different this time from last. And I suppose the question that we would ask ourselves is, is the electrification theme, which pertains to commodities and demand, going to have the same magnitude effect as China coming into the market, both in terms of time, uh, you know, introduction of new demand in a short period of time, uh, and the ultimate level that it can push those commodities to. Because I think if you listen to 
the promotional uh, stories from a lot of MDs and, you know, people talking about what the outlook is for copper and lithium, everything else, the story is this is going to be so much of a bigger story as we go into the next five and ten years. What the commodity pricing is showing is it's actually not going to be quite such a big story. Um, it, it hasn't moved it the way that China did, not yet anyway. So I don't know how to answer the question better than we're wondering yet, but I tend to think that it's probably not quite as big. Okay, so so something else that we did see in common was a lot of M and A in that two thousand and seven period, and there was there was huge deals like Rio buying Alcan and you know supposed deals between Rio and BHB and the like, and we've seen plenty of M and A at the big end of town over the the past year as well, and there's a lot of people in the the smaller end of town hoping it starts to trickle down that way, but if we're sort of looking at this analogy with two thousand and eight, it sort of comes to a grinding halt. How do you see M and A playing out? over the next period. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the factors which we look at for liquidity, uh, the bigger M&A deals. Um, and, and, you know, a, a big deal has got to be bigger than what it was during the bust year, not necessarily achieving the same magnitude as what has happened in the biggest year. In between 2008 and now, we've had the period of 2011 to 15, which saw a huge amount of investors abandon the mining sector on the basis of the returns on capital which had been achieved by many of the, the large miners um, had been exceptionally poor. They were expanding iron ore production in a, in a market that was falling. Um, that, that was arguably then flooding the market and then their returns on capital from those expansions was, was poor as a result. Glencore was quite expo- outspoken about that um, at the time. Uh, I mean, there's, there's loads of examples. And, you know, companies which had made enormous takeover deals like Alcan, Rio for coal in Mozambique, perhaps, you know, $4.2 billion, I think it was, and then sold ultimately the same asset for $50 million to some small entrepreneurs several years later. So, you know, those kinds of examples um, really uh, stuck in the minds of investors in the market. And from 2011 to 15, I would say that the likes of, you know, the people who were managing the biggest mining funds in the world would have been having those conversations with MD saying that was not satisfactory. Uh, we're selling our shares. And and the money moved elsewhere. So I'd say it probably was responsible for the inflation of um, quite of the big tech company valuations uh, in, in the States in particular. You know, money looking for to take risks uh, will move from place to place. And typically from mining to tech is, um, is a bit of a theme we've seen in the past. So uh, I think there is still a caution from MDs and CEOs and boards particularly of the big companies, that the M&A deals they do can't be justified purely by instantaneously building a new business uh, within their, their diversified business or uh, purely for the sake of growth. It has to have a profitability uh, consequence to it. And some of the deals we've seen, I think, are edging towards growth for growth's sake. Um, you know, you, I don't want to name names, but uh, if you're thinking of two big gold companies that both start with N, which are coming together, uh, the synergies in there to me seem far less significant than um, the we will be the biggest gold producer after this, which is probably likely to draw money to their share price than the synergies that they can generate. So um, I, I think there's still a wariness of big deals for growth's sake. doesn't mean we won't see them, but uh, I don't think we'll see anything quite so spectacular as the value destructive deals as we were seeing in 2008. <laughs> Completely agree. And on, on the back of a lot of those mega deals, rather on the back of them not working out, we saw a lot of these companies come out with capital management policies and frameworks and all these things and how going forward they're going to invest counter-cyclically. What I'm keen to know is are there people or are there investors or companies that you, you look at and say they're really good counter-cyclical investors in the natural resource world? I think uh, Evolution and Northern Star have been great counter-cyclical, um, semi-contrarian growth stories in recent years in Australia. Now, they've probably reached levels where their ability to be contrarian and counter-cyclical is somewhat limited, um, but they, they were buying assets from major companies when the major companies were throwing them out. They were, they were no good to those majors. They weren't inflating their value and they needed to uh, reduce their average cost per ounce by pushing them out of their portfolio. And those guys not only saw that, but also knew that they could, I think, probably run those assets more lean uh, and and profitably. Uh, So they're good examples from the past. At the moment, uh, it's it. I'm struggling to spot um, majors, particularly which are 
investing with a counter-cyclical uh, sort of attitude. And, and I guess they, they are subject to market forces as well. So when commodity prices start to weaken, they feel the pinch uh, in their free cash flows. Um, they've often got debt covenants and things like that as large companies. So that makes it difficult for them to say, well, caution to the wind, we will maintain this budget. Lower levels perhaps, maybe in exploration, but a lot of those companies had uh, thinned out their exploration portfolios through the, you know, after 2011 and found themselves with very few options for internal growth, uh, particularly the ability to counter cyclically spend money. So they're in the position now where they probably need to be looking at M&A within their sector. I, I often drift back to gold because it's a sector we've spent a lot of time in, but I suppose the, the, the more modern example is uh, the companies which have recognised that it's going to be cheaper and, and less risky to buy established resources in areas which are already infrastructure rich um, than it is to explore for themselves. So perhaps one of the examples is the, you know, the gold consolidation theme that's, that's fairly prevalent in Western Australia, just given how dense the industry is there. Um, and Musgrave uh, going into probably Romelius, uh, I think is a, a great example of that. And on that consolidation theme, WA Gold, like you say, in the Murchison is the the example that comes to mind. Are there are there other regions around Australia and perhaps globally that you think of? You know, consolidation is going to happen, or it's got to happen there. Well, I, I think a lot of the gold CEOs that commentate on this always say there's far too many gold juniors. Um, it's it's massively in their favour for there to be a huge tail of gold juniors because it gives them an awful lot. To choose from there's all this money being spent on exploration that they don't have to worry about and they can assess that and perhaps be the beneficiaries of it as time goes on um but the the probably the best examples of co- consolidation for a uh, you know for the right reasons we're seeing leonora more or less get consolidated that's probably four or five years too late but you know at least it's happening um th- there's the area to the west of leonora which is still somewhat and laverton uh which is still somewhat uh you know, broadly owned. Um, there's a there's another large mill there owned by Anglo at Sunrise Dam. Uh, so you know, it'd be interesting to see how that all unfolds because big big mills, particularly inside of big companies, often lack uh, baseload feed if they've been there for a very long time. Um, I think uh, south of Kalgoorlie, you know, it used to be the domain of majors. Goldfield still has St Ives. Uh, there's activity now starting at at Norseman. I I wouldn't for a moment think that Norseman and St Ives are compatible assets, but there are quite a few stranded assets around those two uh, processing areas, which may very well in the next, I don't know, one or two years perhaps in the case of St Ives or five to ten years in the case of Norseman come into that orbit. And then you've got smaller areas like uh, Mekathara or Sandstone, uh, which are you know areas which have wonderful endowments and are still seeing exploration success take place in gold for what look to be fairly simple gold mineralisation systems, um, but no processing solutions attached and reasonable size processing either, you know, in a ring around them or not far away. So I, I think those are areas where you'll probably see some consolidation themes still playing out. And and outside of the, the gold space, is there other sort of regions, say Cobar for, for copper or base metals and the like that, that sort of ring a bell with you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think in the – I mean, in nickel is one which – sort of comes to mind as well, and there's been jostling for position there. Uh, but around places like Cobar, co- copper is a harder one because, you know, the processing facilities uh, tended to have done a lot of exploration around themselves historically if they've been a long-lived processing facility. So, uh, I mean, Mount Isa is one reason, well, one region. Um, th- there's a huge amount of copper mineralisation in the area. I think that the people who've run Mount Isa over the years have sort of run the ruler over just about everything that they've seen in the region. So the consolidation which might be available there is more likely to be uh, a handful of juniors or you know a pair of juniors coming together to have a really sensible combination of their respective resources and still have to develop a mill. Um, in the Cobar area, we've seen you know a, a major changing hands of, uh, of of the main processing capacity in that area with. Um, uh, with with the, the changing hands of the CSA, uh, I, I suspect that probably brings a very different mentality to consolidating ground in the area. Glencore has never shown that mentality in, in any of the areas that they work, uh, whereas I think the entrepreneurs, which are the successful entrepreneurs, which are behind that purchase, will probably be looking across the area and saying, how can we absolutely squeeze the most out of this processing facility? 
which helps us make the most of our deep ore, which we have access to in the underground mine. So, yeah, that, that, that's a possible one as well. I want to get into line selection group now. So it's it's been a pretty big year for you guys. You had a, an exit in the, in the Indonesian investment in, in Pani. So why don't we start with you just explaining a bit of, about that and what the sort of position that that leaves Lion in. Sure. Uh, well, going back some time, Lion had made an investment in an unlisted company which had two gold projects in Indonesia. Th these were wonderful projects uh, in a technical sense. They were both very, very large in terms of either their existing resources or their potential uh, to, to extend those resources. What we found as we progressed there was that well, I think everybody knew this, but uh, we were feeling the pinch of Indonesia is a difficult place to operate as a standalone Australian company looking to expand resources and potentially build mines. Uh, so we got involved with some partners on each on each project and uh, and gave them their separate lives. One of one of the projects, Awak Mas, was listed in a company called Nusantara. It was listed on ASX and it had a major shareholder and joint venture partner, which was a an Indonesian coal company. Ended up being taken over by them in 2021. So that was the first of the exits. And I think as far as the money which had gone into that situation from Lion, we did a little bit better than breaking even. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, takeovers are driven by market price. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what we were subject to there. So first good exit, it got some money out of Indonesia. Um, the second project which had been in that, originally in that portfolio uh, was, a, was a project called Pani. Um, it had a, an old resource of about 500,000 ounces and the concept within the company at the time was that it could do a little bit of drilling, see if it could extend that 500,000 ounces by a little bit and it might be able to create a, a small heap leach project which could sustain that unlisted company until such a time as the gold market uh, recovered. First few holes that were drilled returned about 100 to 120 metres of continuous mineralisation circa a gram, so it was looking like, and this was in a mountain, right, so the, the strip ratio was negligible. Um, so that changed the face of that asset quite quickly, but it also brought about uh, some interloping interest. So not long after a resource of 2.4 million ounces uh, had been released, um, the people that owned the surrounding ground were trying to deal uh, with people within the capital structure of how it was owned to, uh, to pull it to pieces. Um, and, and, and I suppose to, to cut that story short, uh, we ended up being able to deal in a, a fairly large and influential partner, um, which ended up becoming the, um, the Indonesian gold mining company, Medeca. Um, and they became our partner. They helped to, I suppose you'd say, solidify and make safe the, uh, the project capital structure. They had intentions on that deposit as well, though. So the game for us really was just about maintaining our interest until such a time as Medeca wanted to own all of that. So Medeca, and uh, in partnership with some of their uh, shareholders, approached us uh, in late 2021 uh, to talk about how it would look for them to own uh, all of that. So we were able to sell our interest to them, announced early 2022, in a deal that combined uh, some Medeca shares uh, and some cash, uh, and we took uh, in excess of uh, 70 million bucks out of that. So between the two of them, we, we netted about 95 million Aussie, uh, which was turned into Australian dollars cash by early this year. We've dividended about uh, 15 of that. Um, there's been a, a, an off-market, an on-market buyback as well. Um, so we've, we've returned some of that, but the rump of it, uh, we wanted to be available for investing because we could see this opportunity in the market coming. Our sense was that liquidity was going to fall away. And um, so here we sit with, I think, the cash balance that was last announced was $76.1 million. That is earmarked for investment principally in Australia, um, we don't really want to go on any adventures in places like Indonesia again. I, I don't even really want to go to Bali on holiday. But uh, so, so Australia is an area where, where we know, uh, we understand the rule of law. Um, that's, that's a big thing having coming out of Indo. Uh, but, you know, our networks here are far better than they are overseas as well. So the opportunities that we can extract might not be as big and exciting. Pani looks like it's turned into 10 million ounces now. Wonderful project. And it, and it will be. It's just difficult to extract huge uplifts of value out of that country. Much, much easier to do that uh, with ASX listed um, opportunities. So, so that's where we're focusing our time and across a, a diversity of commodities. So you've, you've now got, like you said, 76 million in cash. You're, you're pretty cashed up. And as you sort of put it, it's a kind of once in a cycle type of opportunity that you now have. So I want to get into how you go about investing that. And there's 
you know, going from your, your presentations and your quarterly reports, there's a bit of a framework. Like you just said, you want to you focus on Australia. You like commodities like lithium, copper, nickel, gold. You're, you're interested in pre-development stories. So can you, can you expand a bit upon what are the assets that you're targeting? Yep. We like – so those, those commodities you mentioned, gold, nickel, lithium, copper, uh, they're sort of like the top tier of things that we can see – that if you find a project in those commodities, a junior company will have the least stress trying to develop those from a greenfields position by raising the money that it needs to. It, we would be quite open to doing things like zinc, uh, like manganese. Uh, there's a whole range of things on the next tier down. We just see those as being probably a, a slightly more difficult um, challenge. So we'd, we'd love to be exposed to those super future facing things as well as the lower risk things like gold that, that we've always been exposed to. Um, so the way that we're going about that is uh, I think we, we finished 2021 with um, uh, a perspective we were going to have this money and not much of a watch list. There was things that we'd been talking to, people we'd been talking to along the way, but knowing we, we didn't have the capacity to invest at that point, uh, we hadn't fleshed out a watch list, although there was an awful lot of things that were on the to-do list to make up a watch list. We have fleshed that out. That's now um, uh, it's about 60 names that uh, sit across – those commodities and a few others, uh, which they're, they're things that we've assessed with a you know a four or five page, uh, I suppose you'd say review document internally. But we've met with most of the management of those companies, and we feel like our understanding uh, is enough for us to be able to say it's interesting enough to be on the list, um, and we need to wait for the opportunity to invest. Either that's because the price is coming down, and we think it, it can be perfected, or uh, we're just waiting for that liquidity event where they're raising money, and uh, and we can get. A reasonable lick in. We've always had the philosophy that we'd like our money to go to work rather than filling someone else's pockets by taking them off the register. It's good for the money to go into the company and then to be invested and, and, and see them move forwards and uh, can contribute to their financial security. So it, wherever possible, we'll look for fresh equity, but we can invest across the capital structure. So if they'd prefer it to be loaned or as a convertible note, or uh, we'd do a royalty, I'm sure. It's just they're a bit harder to structure than straight equity investments. So we've Spoken earlier about the, the mining cycle and the, the mining clock and all, I want to know in, in Lion's internal thinking, is there a sort of time frame that you guys have on when you want to see or is it really just playing it by ear, watching how the market is performing? Yeah, we're, we're, so we're very driven by what it, where is the cycle at the moment in terms of when should we be making investment decisions and when should we be making divestment decisions. Uh, so our feeling now is that we've come down and that's made that's made a range of things interesting. Uh, we've deployed in some in small numbers so far, but we've we've made deployment into three investments since we uh, sold out of out of Indonesia. Um, there's another one which I think is very very close now, uh, and that that could take place in the next couple of weeks. And there's a range of things which uh, would take us into you know some other commodity areas as well, which I think are probably. Anywhere within the next couple of months, some of those could go up the flagpole quite quickly. Um, so we're, we're happy to be deploying, but in this, in this situation, one of our biggest concerns is that whilst the market is producing for us some really interesting opportunities, um, we're very aware that the biggest risk for investors in these junior illiquid spaces is to be illiquid yourself. So if we were to invest 80 million bucks right now, our investing experience going on 12 months when these companies need their next round of capital, if we're investing, just to use an example price of say five cents in a situation, and then, you know, there's a very good chance, just as good a chance that they'll be three cents next time as being 10 cents, possibly a better chance that they'll be three cents. So happy to nibble away now, but we feel like we're definitely going to be looking for opportunities to follow our money to, to average down uh, in, in a few cases, rather than seeing instant success. So we're happy to start. Uh, we we know that a lot of the people that we can see active in the market, and that's becoming very very few, uh, their liquidity is draining. So you know we're we're happy to be watching for these opportunities to improve, having tagged them with a with a first and initial, uh, I suppose you'd say, entry investment. So how much then of that eighty million roughly is flagged for follow on investments and for initial outlays of capital? Uh, hard to break it down into exact numbers, but I think you could probably think of it as uh, we want to have a portfolio of ten to twenty things. Uh, so we don't want to be we don't want to be trading across the market. Uh, we can see opportunities to do that, but it's it's hard to do that in the volumes that we want to invest. If if someone's going to raise money because they're going to discover lithium, 
you know, that can go up and down on half the amount of money that we might want to put in. So if we put our money in and ride it up and down, we still might not see that benefit in terms of liquidating a, an investment. Uh, so 10 to 20 things which we can follow over a five-ish year time period. And I'd say that this year, uh, 2023, you'll probably see us deploy up to a quarter of that. Um, so we're, we're watching for a market which is still weak. Uh, and then as these companies progress, we want to make sure that they're financially secure to get through the, the hardest of the raisings, which is what you have to do when you're, you're funding feasibility studies and things like that. So, and, and given that so many of these are at a similarly early exploration type stage, how do you think about sort of sizing the positions? Is there a sort of set, you know, initial investment size that you have or do you still have conviction within the various... Oh. Sometimes something is extraordinarily cheap and uh, greed overcomes any form of sensibility. So we put, uh, we put about a million bucks into something in December last year, unlisted company. We've been talking to them for, for a number of years and the valuation was such that we, we just went for a, a large percentage there. So uh, we own, I think it's over 30% of that now. Um, so there's no rule for what percentage we'd like to be at um, there's been plenty of other things where, uh, you know, the, the market at the time was exciting news flow, challenging market conditions, but we'd like to be within the story. Um, and we can see that they've got the ability to, within their portfolio of assets, to literally shoot the lights out and, and draw a lot of attention to themselves with one piece of news. You know, you're speculating a bit, but you're happy enough with what they've got. And you can see there's that huge upside potential there. So, you know, in that case, we might go for half a percent or something like that. Uh, but generally, if you hold between 5 and 20%, you're entitled to a, a discussion with management about what the strategy of the company is and, and to be able to contribute. Um, you, you never want to force that on a company uh, because if you're having to do that, then you've got your assessment wrong. Uh, you're working with the wrong people. That, that's not what we want to find ourselves doing. And you just mentioned an, an unlisted investment. How do you think about investing in unlisted plays versus listed plays? Well, unlisted plays don't fall in price uh, <laughs> as readily as listed ones do. So from, a, from the perspective of a company which has to report an NTA, there's an, there's an attraction there. What I really like about an unlisted play is that there's the opportunity to shape and sculpt that uh, and bring it to market at some stage in a, in a way which is quite attractive to the market at the time. So we, we see, and that's a company called Plutonic uh, that we're working with. They've got, they've got two I mean, they are remarkably exciting uh, exploration um, targets at the moment. They're, they're, they're like nothing you see in the listed market in terms of size and scale. It's exploration, so you might find absolutely zilch, but they have district discovery potential in both cases of their targets, and that's what's drawn us to that. Now, if, if that's the case, um, getting those things drill ready and uh, bringing it to market when it when it needs to raise a drilling budget and then investing alongside incoming investors, I think, um, has a lot going for it in terms of attracting uh, good investment to the company in a recovering market uh, and offering huge upside potential as well. So from a line perspective, that's a very attractive thing to have in the portfolio because it's the kind of thing that can deliver uh, 100 to 1,000 times upside rather than just 5 to 10. And there was one more thing that I'd noticed that stood out on some of Lion's presentations, and that's sort of discussing a future as a mining entity. How, how does the internal thinking go around what the company looks like in a few years' time? Well, we've come across some wonderful assets in our time, uh, and we've seen quite a few of them get tied up into bigger companies which have been quite successful in their own right as a, as a mining company going forward. We'd, we'd prefer the market to think of Lion as a mining entity uh, and because you know, we we invest in things far more sparingly than most other listed investment companies do, yet we're classified as an LIC on ASX. And and the I think the rub off that that gives us is that small LICs, uh, even up to you know medium sized enterprises, tend to trade at a discount to their NTA most of the time. Whereas if we're a mining company that had sold an investment, uh, gone to cash. We would, I dare say, trade at a premium to that cash. So we'd have a small positive enterprise value. As it is at the moment, Lion, and I think this is because it's an LIC and no other reason, uh, we trade at a discount to our NTA, but a discount to our cash backing as well. So great opportunity for, for people wanting to buy something cheap. You're getting cash cheaper than, it, you know, cheaper than the cash, but that cash's purchasing power has multiplied uh, since we went to cash as well. So what we could have bought for 80 in 2021, we can get twice as much now. Um, but moving on from that, uh, 
think of ourselves as a mining entity. Uh, we deploy capital in a very similar way. Um, so, you know, as opposed to an LIC, which typically has a portfolio of maybe 100 things uh, and is far more liquid across those investments as well, so can move in and out and, and balance uh, across the things that they want to have more exposure to. We can't and we don't. Um, you know, if you own an exploration uh, project, your, your liquidity on that is next to nothing. You've got to make a success of it before you can sell it. So that, that's why we think of ourselves as a mining entity. But it's also worth reflecting that in, uh, I think the year was about 2010 or 11, we had a reasonable sized investment in a company called Catalpa. Uh, I think it was about 33%. We underwrote a rights issue, which uh, provided the equity um, for Catalpa to become a gold producer, so the development finance. Um, and we went up to about 50% of Catalpa at that stage. We vended in an asset to Catalpa, which was a 30% joint venture interest in a gold mine in Queensland. Um, that turned them into a miner. Uh, they ended up with two assets, and that became the cornerstone of um, the evolution that we know today, evolution mining. So Edna May, uh, Krakow in Queensland, and the Conquest assets, Mount Carlton, um, were the original foundation assets. Now, Jake Klein has done a wonderful asset of building that wonderful job of building that asset collection into what is evolution now. We can't claim any of the brilliance of that, but I think there's probably a sense of, well, you know, could Lion have had more of a participation in what happened there? So just, you know, keeping our minds clear and open to the opportunity of, uh, well, if we end up with a collection of assets and they're difficult to sell or it makes more sense strategically for them to be together, how can we play a part in that taking place in the future? Because uh, I think shareholders ultimately are better off in a bigger pool of assets than a smaller one. Uh, and that's, we're looking for shareholder outcomes there. Absolutely. So I, I want to move into some commodities now. I'm going to chat about tin, copper, gold, and a few others. I want to start with tin because I just find it fascinating. And I'm not sure how much time you, you spend or waste on Twitter, but there's a, <laughs> there's a bit of a community out there for, for tin and you know, the, it sort of goes that anyone who's long tin and a part of this community is a is a tin baron. And I notice that you guys do have a bit of exposure in in Morocco, from my understanding. So would you would you classify yourselves or line as tin barons? Do you do you like the sort of thematic behind it? I wouldn't call us tin baron. I wouldn't call us any sort of baron, really. Uh, we appreciate the fundamentals for all the commodities differently, but um, they they tend to move in quite strong correlation. So whether you like tin or copper. You know, you might as well be in both or one or the other, uh, and your experience could be quite the same. Tin is a small market, so it tends to squeeze up and squeeze down with a, with a bit more abruptness than copper does. But uh, I mean, we, one thing we love about tin is that it definitely is a critical material. Uh, it's not mined anywhere near as broadly as things like even copper, and definitely not gold. Um, I think the words you use were the most strategic, non-strategic mineral out yeah. there. Well, I think that the strategic moniker is a little bit political. It's not necessarily driven by uh, demand and, and supply fundamentals. So, um, you know, one man's strategic is another man's not. Uh, and if if one of those happens to be an American, um, you know, then I suppose commodities which are produced primarily by China and not sold to the US become highly strategic. Uh, whereas if you're a country like Australia, which does sell things to China, um, and there's a consequence in the, the global political spheres that you work in of declaring something as strategic, like copper. I don't think Australia classifies copper as a, um, as a strategic mineral, nor tin. Uh, you might come under a bit of pressure from some of your pals in the diplomacy clubs about who you're selling those materials to. So uh, I've always tended to think that um, you know, some of the things which are strategic uh, tend to have a, here's who you may sell them to, and here's how you may supply the global market connotations to them uh, as some of the more influential people in politics breathe down the necks of some of those people in, in mining. So you touched on copper there. That's another one I want to talk about. I think the the sort of bull thesis is pretty fleshed out, so I don't think we need to go too into that. But what I do want to know is where you look for opportunities in the copper space right now, given there's a bit of a dearth on the, on the ASX. Yeah, look, I think copper happens in camps. So uh, places like North Queensland, Tennant Creek, uh, South Australia, wonderful places to look for copper. Um, the exploration game is a hard one to play because you might perceive a very large prize and, and come up with nothing over and over and over again. So I'm quite wary of copper stories that say there should be, there should be something here, but we're not onto it yet. South Australia, I think, probably fits into that. Uh, there's very little at the surface in the most prospective parts of South Australia to determine whether or not there should be something there. You need to drill holes, and that, in, that adds an element of expense into that. 
But, I mean, North Queensland, uh, there is a huge scattered ground positions of uh, lots of juniors working there, established resources, um, and in some cases, you know, quite high-grade things coming together. So we've been paying a lot of attention to that part of the world as to how new copper resources and uh, sensible combinations of copper resources could come together. Um, places like Tennant Creek, you know, it's a smaller number of juniors working there, but there's been a very strong copper flavour there over the years. Uh, and, I mean, in, in our investment in Plutonic, uh, I think gold is probably the flavour of what they're looking to discover, but there is a very strong uh, sense of copper potential behind that as well. So probably a little bit more on the edgy, risky uh, way of looking at it. But then, you know, you can also contemplate, I suppose, uh, the rejuvenation of old assets. And there's not a lot of those uh, which are available that have established resources. Um, I spent a bit of time looking at Mount Lyle before New Century disappeared. Uh, and I think that's quite an attractive asset, not operated for a number of years, has a monstrous reserve and obviously a very, very bad taste in the mouth of the market after the way that that project sort of found its way into, well, not being operated and, and collapsed. Um, it took a bit of vision from New Century to, to take it on uh, and I think that would be interesting to see how it works out. So, you know, if something like that was ever contemplated to be brought back to the market, it, I'd, I'd want to have a close look at that. So you, you touched on gold there as well. What is the attraction? Is it mainly just the, the simplicity of gold versus other commodities that draws you to it? Yeah. So I, I don't have any facts or figures for you at the moment about the number of gold companies, but you know, empirically, if, if 10 companies come in here with opportunities for us, probably four or five of them would be gold. So automatically, more, most of what we're seeing is gold. Um, and then that means we're probably going to make a disproportionately larger amount of assessments of those things and they have a better chance of moving up the tree. Um, in saying that, if you and I wanted to be gold miners, and, and maybe I'm talking to the wrong person from the Money of Mine team there, but uh, you know, we'd, we, we could go out with a shovel and a gold pan and we could be gold miners. Might be more attractive to go underground with a jumbo, but uh, <laughs> let's keep it simple. You could sell your product in the street out there. Um, in fact, you know, in a place like Kalgoorlie, there's four or five places you could walk in with a quantity of gold and, and be able to convert it into cash quite readily. Uh, you go into any other commodity, uh, you're going to need trucks, uh, in some cases railway lines and ports, to be able to sell your product and you can't sell a finished product. In a lot of cases, you're stuck with uh, an argument with a smelter or a metals trader about what penalties and discounts and other things are going to apply to what it is that you're going to sell. So you're not going to get 100% value for your product. Uh, things like copper, I think you get about 90%. You know, nickel's about the same, zinc, a bit worse. And you get hit with penalties for smelting charges and impurities and everything else. So it, copper, gold is, is simple in that sense. We're certainly not gold bugs. Uh, there's a lot of people in, invest in the gold space who I, I suppose you'd say are a little bit conspiratorial in their views about what's going to drive the gold price. We, we tend not to subscribe to those sorts of theories. Uh, but, you know, in an environment like this where inflation is a thing, interest rates are a thing, um, and there's large amounts of debt, and uncertainty that creeps in. Gold, you know, has a couple of flavours to it there which tend to uh, perform quite well, or historically anyway. Lithium's the, the last commodity I want to touch on, Headley. So a lot of the exploration players we've seen pop up with lithium and lithium, you know, pegmatite hits or really they're seeing pegmatites. They've gone, they've gone flying beyond what you think is reasonable. It feels pretty hyped and, and hot at the minute. How does this sort of behaviour make you think about your lithium investments? Well, to be careful for a start, uh, I've always um, subscribed to the notion. In fact, I'll just quote my father here because this is where, the, where it comes from. But people are always prepared to pay more for something that they don't understand than something that they do. It's a bit perverse, but it's far more exciting to be investing at the moment in someone who's hitting, you know, broad seams of pegmatite. Um, and, you know, if it's got lithium in, that seems an afterthought sometimes, although I think we're, we're moving more towards the market wanting to see that grade before they really commit. Um, but, you know, with that froth around, uh, the assessments that we've been doing are things which we would like to consider as a lithium exposure. Uh, you know, the more ground position that you've got that has prospective geology, the better. The more data rich it is, the better, uh, because you've got a greater opportunity of having same style of discovery as just about everybody else has made that has made a genuine lithium project discovery. And by that, I mean, the discoveries we've seen haven't been driven by science or, you know, really clever targeting. They've been prospecting discoveries. So you think of Kidman, uh, Pilbara, um, Azure most recently. Um, who else have we got? Um, 
uh, lion tam. Those are all pegmatites at surface. There were geologists that knew they were there uh, and have been able to walk up and drill them. Now, the extent to which they were well known and understood and everything else is, you know, probably varies. But I don't think that you could say that those companies said, let's identify this ground for lithium. Let's go out there and just see what's there and then do some geochem and some geophysics and all the standard exploration and see what surprises us. In each case, they so were able to walk out there and go, oh, lithium. In some cases, uh, there, were, there were drill holes, which had been done for some other commodity, but already showed a uh, quite significantly thick deposit. And that's the case of Kidman. You know, it was gold drilling that found that in the 90s, I think. Uh, but it, you know, it wasn't realised as a discovery, if you like, until the, um, the noughties. All right, let's get into some of the investments that you guys have made. So the first two, it makes sense to discuss together, Alto and Great Boulder. So there's a lot of sort of excitement around this this region, you know, bang in the middle of WA at, at the moment. The way you think about this, is it, you know, two individual stocks or is it you really like the, the region? Is that what's attracted you? In both cases, really like the region, yes. Uh, and in both cases, they, I think, have uh, an amount of leverage at least to the Western Australian gold consolidation theme in that the, they both now have established resources. Great Boulder is a bit more recent in terms of a maiden resource. Um, Great Boulder is in the Meekathara area and, and just the basic geology that they're working on is you've got the Paddy's Flat mineral field uh, to the west and if you follow the same stratigraphy around the fold, you end up on the eastern side of that fold which has been nigh on unexplored. There are workings in some areas uh, and there's perhaps a little bit more cover so it, it looks as if that area is mineralised and what those guys are showing is that it is. Now, the thing I love about Great Boulder, apart from the fact that they've established resources there and will continue to expand that is, you know, you could, you could pick up a hot pie in Mekathara and not touch it until you get to the drill rig and it'll still be hot to burn your mouth. So, you know, you could pick up a coffee for the driller and it, it'll be enjoyable by the time you get there. You could, you could not quite chuck a rock and hit the process facilities that are in the area. Now, whether or not there's compatibility between people to make a deal on that, I'm, I'm I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen imminently. It's more you can see an exit path there where there are valuable resources that it's sensible to bring together with the processing facilities which exist there. Uh, so that's that's one thing. I guess there's been mines built in the area. The proposition of building process facilities in that part of the world is well understood. So I feel quite comfortable that what gets found there could be uh, commercialised quite sensibly. And when you think of natural acquires in the, in the region there, the likes of West Gold, Romelius come to mind. Are there other players, given a lot of the mid-cap gold players, seem to have a bit of a, a shortage of reserve ounces that come to mind that you think could come into the area and buy out these explorers? P probably not for Great Boulder. Uh, I, th I think um, you know, West, West Gold's processing facilities there are the first choice. Uh, and it depends on grade, really. I mean, um, if you were to find something which was significantly high grade, and there's parts of Mulga Bill have returned some eye-wateringly rich gold intersections, so the, there will be uh, material there which is which is truckable. Um, now that that might necess that that might um, provide the ability to be sending it to more distant um, process facilities. I guess uh, I've heard people talk from time to time about a combination with. Um, Andy Well, which is further to the north. And I suppose if you think of the combination of two juniors, uh, there are proto resources which are available in both places and a processing facility site. I don't know if that makes completely neat logical sense. Uh, I can see combining resources would be sensible. Is Andy Well a good processing site? Well, probably. It's probably not ideal, but it wouldn't be the worst solution either. So there's a, there's a couple of outcomes there for them. And Alto, I mean, Alto is surrounded. There are five or six processing facilities all within a circa 150 kilometre radius. So there's, there's quite a lot going on there for potential truckability. Uh, and they're all fairly hungry mills. Um, now, having said that, there's, there's other resources in the area. And I think, um, that, you know, there's, you can see that in the future there could very well be uh, a critical mass which is generated just by seeing those companies decide to process together or, or to combine themselves. Some of the other investments that you guys have, Fosco, Erden, there's a, there's a couple other legacy uh, investments. What, what's the thinking with these? Are you, are you looking to realise these once it's sort of viable and sell them and put the money in the ground in Australia or is there you know, an alternative to that? What, what we've said is that we're, uh, we anticipate modest follow-on in some cases there. Uh, in the case of Erden, um, they are developing a gold mine now uh, in Mongolia. Um, it's it's going to be like a four gram open pit at surface. So 
Sorry, again, we're, we're not going to be using any jumbos there in the uh, near future. But, um, you know, that, that, that project has – it looks as if it has all the equity invested that it needs and they're going through the debt process now to, uh, to pull together the rest of the, um, the money that they need. But the plant site is being readied. The camp is being built. They've broken ground. Um, so that, one's, that, that one feels like it's fairly mature in terms of the way that Lion looks at investments. And as they get to the point of producing cash flow – they get viewed by the market as a cash flow producing miner. And and our view on that would be that it's it's north of the current share price. So it would be logical for us at that point to start to determine whether or not we want to be there long term. And I think that's probably one of the ones which finds its way out of the portfolio sooner rather than later. Um, we we want to invest all if not most most if not all of the money that we have in Australia. Uh, so there, there, there could be exceptions to that, particularly in the case of legacies, but uh, we see ourselves, particularly in new investment, being Australian focused. Beautiful. Last up, we've got underrated versus overrated. So, Nedley, we're looking for one word answers here. If, if you don't know it, we can just pass and move on. It'll be commodities and some exploration names. Let's get into it. First up, Hot Chili, the Chilean copper explorer, developer. Underrated. Xanadu Mines. Overrated. Keel Mining. Underrated. London Metals. Uh, asset underrated. Sorry, I'm going to multi-word answers here, aren't I? Got to be careful about valuation in these things sometimes, but uh, asset underrated. Beautiful. Nico Resources. Uh, I'd, I'd have to take that one on advisement for the moment. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to comment on something that I didn't understand thoroughly. No problem. Cobalt as a commodity. Overrated. Antipa Minerals. Underrated. Love the ground position. Uh, very large. I don't have to qualify these things, do I? So no. underrated. <laughs> You're all good. <laughs> Osgold. Overrated. Predictive Discovery. Uh, I've watched that one for a while. We had an early exposure and uh, had really liked what they did. So uh, I, I think for now um, – Africa is the big question, but that asset with those people, underrated. Graphite as a commodity. Overrated. Can, can I say overrated plus plus? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Carnaby resources. Uh, ground position, underrated. Valuation probably reflects only a small portion of that. It's the only qualifier I'd put on it. Sovereign metals. Uh, again, would want to research that one a bit more before I qualified it. No problem. And lastly, Labyrinth Resources. Underrated. Beautiful. Thanks a lot for making it the, the time today. Appreciate you coming on and hopefully we can have you again in the future, Hedley. Oh, look, it's been an absolute delight. So thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, if ever I can uh, chat to you guys again, I'd love to. Cheers, Hedley. Oh, JD, you've just coming up with the goods this week, mate. Another sensational interview. And I've always been complimentary of all three instead of the way I would have done it and just be like, right, I just tell me everything you know. Very carefully researched and you've done your digging and it was all pertinent to all the, their company and what they do. So, mate, it was a, it was mate, a, you're steep, a bloody genius. A steep learning curve from panicking with the camera and the mic on the first day. But <laughs> I think there was a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of. Me getting better with the recording, with not cooking the audio for, for you lads over the three days. So there's hopefully a bit more of that coming. Very impressive. I, mate. Think, I think the words that come out of Trav's mouth was fucking LJD <laughs> when he was doing a lot of those <laughs> editing sessions. Well, it, it came out really well, so I didn't think it was too oh, bad. Right, it's all good. You're evolving. That was after a bit of work. <laughs> no, good stuff. Oh. Righto. Another great interview, JD. Thanks to all our partners, JP Search, Top Drill, Anytime Exploration, Terra Capital, and K Drill. Thanks a lot, guys. I Thanks, said guys. them all right, don't I? I always think, did I say one You're twice in this one? Hooteroo. Hooteroo. <laughs> Hooteroo. I'll stop now. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.